like to thank Sisi Patokanasiu for uh, the wonderful team of Arlo here for having organized this event. I want to congratulate especially Sisi for being here so uh, have that uh, courage and tenacity to animate the activities of the Arlo over the 15 years. And I also like to thank the people of my beloved uh, Benaki Museum. <coughs> and Dr. Joseph Mankins, who support this year's employer. And last but not least, Mikhail Andonin, who insisted in asking me to organize this panel in a related today's session. Of course, I'd like to thank the three <coughs> speakers who spoke to the at the invitation, and I also thank all of you for being here. So before starting this panel, let me present some thoughts on how we decided to organize it. When Miguel called me and talked to me about this year's program of the Analogia Festival, I recall in my memory a number of discussions we had, I'm afraid to say more than 20 years ago, within the framework of the European Network of Research and Communication Performance Prediction Program. We were brainstorming on the construction of the database of the productions of the European uh, Performance Prediction Program. Although we had a general agreement concerning the basic fields that would be necessary for the database, we fell in a great difficulty while approaching one problem, how to define translation. This might have been the first time that we all had to rethink our position towards the term and realize how much this work, this work sounded different to the mind of each one of us as our group consisted of people coming from classics and people coming from theater studies, we wanted to be very clear in what we would define as translation. We were very perplexed. There was a rather embarrassing confusion. Some suggested that we should add a module of the database we had to measure how much distant was the translation from the original ancient text. Some others proposed to forget the word translation and use only the word, the word adaptation. And I do remember, on the occasion of the conference organized at the Archive Performance of Britain, Rome, and Oxford, that one speaker, in trying to avoid the problems posed by the word translation, proposed the neologism translocation, or even the word transaction. Which, despite its religious origin, or maybe due to this. So the problem was again there, and it still is here. So, since the existence of theater studies and the realization that there is a gap, an inevitable gap between page and stage, I would not like to mention the confliction of that relation between theater and literature. It's another problem. The main problem remains. The problem of translation remains not only as a topic of vivid exchange, but mainly as a barometer. It is an indicator of our rigidity and our tolerance. It is situating the threshold of our tolerance. And it's in this openness that our free speakers will approach the topics of vivid exchange. So, let me present the guests. I will make a presentation and then after the other demonstrate. <coughs> <coughs> Probably some of you have already met Oliver Dublin, who some of his books have been translated already in English. We are here in the of the SSMP Bauchez, it's Greek Russian Action, published in the first of the first first publication in 1988, more than one. And Elie Conte in Great Fire in 1990. He's a Merit Professor of Classics at Oxford University and fellow of modern, of modern college in Oxford. He was elected to the Richard Academy in 1985 and was awarded an honorary doctorate from our department of theater studies at the University of Athens. His first book has been the very influential on the stagecraft of Aeschylus, and among his recent books, Pots and Plays, published uh, recently in 2007, is a thorough and a jerk examination of the interactions between tragedy and the Greek based painting of the 4th century BC. Co founder of the Archive of Performance of Greek and Roman Drama in Oxford, 
also co-founder of ACNA, our European Network of Research. And throughout his career, he tried to keep one foot outside the academy, especially in broadcasting and theatre. Recently, he has been translating plays with the aim of including the kind of musicality and color uh, effective in live performance, will be effective in live performance. He has published already in the air, so for is the King of the Tragedies, and most lived recently as Kilos of Estia in the North Conditions 2015, that will be also the subject of his presentation. Herman Adelman studied classics and field studies at the University of Amsterdam. As a visiting professor, Herman lectured at the Free University of Amsterdam, Utrecht University, and Leiden University. He has been a very active member of our network, ACNET, at the summer course, uh, the summer course uh, at the summer courses of which he offered a very interesting seminar on translation practices. <coughs> he translated several great practices, by Eskers and the for professional theater companies in the Netherlands and Belgium, and worked with many directors, among them, as you say, names of Paul Cook and John Simmons. The performance of Backhead by Simmons Cook and Altman has been played in Athens in the end of the Saturday in 2003, if I'm not wrong. And that was really, really an extremely interesting and powerful production. He also worked with Paul Cook and Mikhail Marinos for Hickey Dillers in 2006 in a period. Recently, he wrote a play, a modern Greek tragedy, Illus, which was commissioned by uh, two music groups in Amsterdam. Uh, recently, in 2018, he completed the translation of Jean Racine's uh, Antoinette. And presently, he's working on a translation of Lignon, which is a new requiem composed by the Greek, that <coughs> Composer Kayoki Tsubaki uh, for November Music, which is an international festival for November Music in Holland. Astrid Schenker is a dramaturg, theater studies scholar, and translator, guest lecturer, guest lecturer at the Zurich University, the Zurich School of Arts, where she teaches courses on translation, theater translation. Holder of a PhD for the Freie Universität Berlin, she is a research associate. Of at the International <coughs> Research Center Interweaving Performance Cultures at the Friday Institute. But this, this is the most fascinating, productive, and dynamic research center of field studies founded several years ago by Ida She has been working at among others for the Rune Verstille, the German Cultural Foundation, the International Festival Kunstfest Weimar, and as a dramaturg for visual artists. She's been working as a drummer since 2011 with uh, French director Stéphane Tranchelet uh, at the Théâtre de l'Écolique and also at the Théâtre de Lyon. And together with uh, Stéphane Tranchelet, he, she is responsible for the current French translations of the plays of the Norwegian, playwright and novelist Harden Lee. So, after the Thomas our session, the title of her paper, the paper is The Unendliche Aufgabe on theories and practices of translation. A title that, to my opinion, illustrates the challenges of every translation. If the word unendliche, unendliche is easy to translate as never ending or endless, the policing of the word afgabe constitutes already a complicated choice for translation. In a dictionary, we can read the following possible meanings of the word afgabe in Greek and English. Cathedral, proportion, <coughs> duty, task, job, purpose. Parency, retirement, withdrawal, surrender. Clisting, closing down. Provino, askisi, pressure, exercise. Ergaseo, speaking, homework, apostolic, mission. So, on this subject, I read the floor and I invite uh, Ashley to take the floor. Thank you very much. As usual. Okay. Hello everyone, thank you Platon for this kind of uh, introduction to all of us and thank you to all of you for bearing with us. 
Platinum of the Move that was already introduced the title of my talk, and you can see it up there. And as he said, die unendliche Aufgabe is quite a challenging phrase already. It's a quote by a German author, professor of English and translator, Klaus Reichert, who has published extensively on translation as well. The title only consists of three words. It's an article, it's an adjective, and it's a noun. And in the German context, it should be rather simple and easy to translate. But as we just heard, it's not that easy. So we have endless or never ending for unendliche. And then we have the ring of Aufgabe as task, but also as capitulation. So could translation be a never ending or endless capitulation? This question will be the first question of this talk. And in the next 12 minutes, I want to raise some more. The question of what is translation, to me, can only be answered with more questions. In 2016, a new German translation of the Aristarian came out in Germany. It was published in the Rekalam Publishing House, which is the uh, most common and most famous. So every student, every um, pupil, uh, every theater person goes to this publishing house when reading a new play. It was done by Coach Steinmann. And um, Steinmann's translation is closely following the old Greek text. And it even tries to keep up with the old verse um, but it apply, it's applying uh, colloquial phrases. He does this to make the understanding easier. The critics say that Steinmann makes the difficulties not easy and the foreign and strangeness not close, but more accessible. However, for the field of theatre and performance, a different translation of the Oris Tire is most popular, and it's that of Peter Stein and Bert Seidensticker. And we will hear more about this in the following talks. And for those of you who listen closely, yes, both translators carry the word Stein, Stone, and the name. <laughs> His translation of Peter Stein um, is unlike the newest one, does not stick to the verse form, but is written in prose, which at that time was um, quite new. And the staging of the Aristea by Peter Steinmeier is one of the most important moments of German theatre history for many reasons, and we will not be able to talk about all of them during that time here. Bernd Steinsticker, who worked together with Peter Stein on the translation, writes that Stein, in this performance of Aristea, came close to the spirit of the original, as rarely anyone before. I stumbled over that phrase for two reasons. One is that Seidensticker surely cannot speak about all performances, but only the ones he has seen and only the ones in a very um, small part of the world. But the second part, my second stumbling point was the urge to come as close to the essence of the original, to the spirit. Where does it come from? And he's not alone with that question, that urge. This claim is repeated over and over again and by many translators and translation theorists. And it's worth asking what's behind that urge. So when is a translation considered to be successful? Additionally, when translating a text that will be used in a performance, an additional challenge arises. The text does not only have to convey context, meaning, form, musicality, but it also needs to be speakable by the performers on stage, and it needs to be hearable and understandable by the spectators who only hear it in the moment of saying. So next question, in what ways need a translation to consider its use, its medium, and its audiences? <clears throat> if you're not too familiar with different translations, you may wonder how different can translations be? And as Platon introduced in the beginning, they can be very different. Coming back to the Oris Tire, and to use an often cited example, it's at the very beginning, it's the guard's report. Um, that's how it starts off. Um, and in, uh, in the old Greek and the new German translation, he's talking about having an ox on the tongue. And as I know and believe, um, it's very close to the old Greek. So Peter Stein, he stayed close but went a bit further. He talked about the bull that is standing on the tongue. So the ox turned into a bull. Then we have another option, which is a golden key that's closing the mouth. That's Droysen. 
we have another example, which is my mouth is stuffed tightly, so there's a force in it. It's the lamamoods, and I have one last. It's heavy hobbles of fetters are binding tightly my tongue. That's the one by Humboldt. Just to give you a few examples of the very same phrase. So, what is translation if there are so many alternatives? And shouldn't the question be, when is the translation? To begin at the end, what does a project or work need um, for a translation? First of all, very basically, it tells us that there's a situation in which one person is confronted with something she or he does yet not yet understand. The confrontation with something strange or unknown. And one day way to deal with this situation can be to translate it. Translate words, actions, contexts. And through this act of translation, the unknown is understood to be put into one own grammar or language. It's a trans transformation. Or at least a transformation to something that I can react to. If this is the only way to deal with the situation, I may leave up for discussion. And there are several ways of fields for translating. One is, of course, one language into another. But many people say that already the very act of reading is a process of translation. So whenever I read a text in you, there's a transformation going on in my head. And you might only see it by a brow going up or not. And the communication between me and Hermann, maybe, is an act of translation, guessing, interpreting what the other one might say. One language to the other, I said before, changing the media, going from the text onto stage. And then there's a whole question of cultural translation. But coming back to the text for now. In existing theories of translation, two main lines of thinking come across that of course can be completed by other models. And Friedrich Steiermacher, a German philosopher, um, put them out. Very interesting. It's, a, it's worth a reading the text. It's called about the different methods of the translator, written in 1813. And he gave this talk at the Academy of Science in Berlin. He uh, differentiates between two different ways of translating. And one is moving the reader towards the original text. And the second is moving the text towards the reader. What does it mean? So moving the reader towards the text just means trying to bend the rules of one's own language. So that when you read this, you might feel, oh, that's a bizarre way to put it. or that's strange. Oh, that's an interesting image. It does not feel familiar, but you are able to dive into it. Steiermacher tries to say it as if the author knows this language, but he's not part of this language. And the second one is moving the text towards the reader, as if the text had been written in that language from the beginning on. Even Steiermacher says that this is the one that's almost not possible. And Steiermacher. Um, talks about the purpose of translation as the true enjoyment of foreign works. And this truly means the pure enjoyment, trying to find the real core of those works. And here you can sound the Leibensteiger from the beginning again, trying to find the real spirit of the text. One interesting point with Leibensteiger as well is the strengthening of the own language. He says the plurality of languages and the transporting of that plurality through translation does strengthen the own language. And of course, he has already the project of the nation states and the upcoming Europe in his mind. That's the background. So what purposes do translations have? And more precisely, this question is related to another one. For whom is the translation done? Peter Stein puts this question of function, the aim of his particular translation, into the center of his attention. He says, and that's my translation. This translation of the Oresteia is characterized by the fact that it was not created for literary or academic purposes, and also not for theater and performances in general, but for a very particular performance, for very particular actors, for a particular theater, and in the context of a long planned project about how to approach the anti-tragedy, and for my own direction. Also, the German philosopher Walter Benjamin focused on the functions of translation in his famous essay on the task of a translator. It's 
originally written in French and he transposed it, as he says, uh, himself into German. He asks why translations are needed and says that a translation should not be for the reader, reader as the original is not written for the reader as well. Another thing to put up for question. <coughs> for him, it's only in the translation that the original can unfold at its best. So he sees that there's a surplus and more that only comes out in the translation, a certain variety. To briefly give you the context, so Benjamin is connected to this philosophy of language. And it implies for him that languages are not strange to each other, but are freed from all historical conditions, they are related to each other. So in a the core, there's one common thing to all languages. And for Benjamin, translation is one way to hint to that core and to, to hit that common ground. He, at one point, he called it the virtual, the virtual languages that you can find between lines that he's trying to find. Therefore, for him, translation are only temporary ways to deal with foreign languages. For him, a true translation is transparent. It's not covering or hiding the original, and it's not taking away its life, but it's aiming at the true language. Peter Stein, in his translation, interprets transparency in a pragmatic way. He tends to give several alternatives if the translation of one word is unclear or contested. He simply puts them one after the other, including the listener or reader into his process of understanding a translation. So when I try to translate the unendliche Aufgabe as the never ending or endless task, that's what Stein would do. He's not choosing between never ending or endless, but he just gives you both. And that's for you as a reader or listener, shows you both aspects, both nuances of the word. And it also shows you that maybe it cannot be kept into just one word, so it makes you part of the process of translating. Another way to, um, to find this is um, Felicitas Hoppel shows this for one of her texts. It's a German writer, and in one of her stories, there's a um, fictional narrator narrating this story, and it's unclear in German if this narrator is um, a woman, a man, or a non binary person. You just cannot tell. Now, when translating this um, text, there are many languages when it's not possible to keep it this way. So you have to decide if it's a woman or a man. For example, for the phrase, I am beautiful, ich bin schön, in German and in English, it could be said by a woman or a man. If I say it in French, and I believe for Greek it's probably the same, je suis beau, je suis belle, already by the word you choose, it tells you if, if, what kind of gender the character has. It's easy to do it, it's rather easy to do it in written language, so you could just use a slash and show the reader it can be both and hint to the original. But what, what do you do when you say it and when you put it on stage? That's against the question. Stein um, is supported by the words of another famous German poet, and that's Goethe. For Goethe said that for the mass so for the common people, a simple translation is the best, while for scholars among each other and their entertainment, an ambitious translation can be used. So Stein calls this translation, not a translation, he calls it a nacherzählung, a narrating, a post-narrating of the tale. And it was important to him that the spectator, the listener of the text, would understand and really get a chance to understand everything and not stand in front of a closed door and a closed text. This is one of the reasons why he translated it into prose. One last aspect before I close that needs to be briefly mentioned, and it hints back at the question for whom a translation is done and also by whom. It goes back to Edmund Carey, um, who wrote in 1956 a short uh, text on translation in the modern world. He calls the translation an important cultural work for the understanding of their own culture. And he says the translator is a mediator that's always losing something that he cannot transport from one to the other way. Also for him, he says that the translator should aim at one language and at a world in peace and onto harmonic ages. Now that sounds for us a bit, mm, maybe a bit naive today. I don't know what's the right word, but we are talking about 56 and it's post-war time. So he's writing from that perspective. 
He says that the patient work of a translator prepares for the age of harmony and peace. So he's putting himself against Schleiermacher, who said that we need the plurality of languages to get stronger, while as Benjamin and um, Kerry, they are looking out to, to find this one base question, uh, um, language. For Kerry, however, the necessity of translation also includes the necessity of a choice. Oh, and we just saw that in different examples. And this carries along, comes along with the responsibility. So yes, processes of translation always include a variety of choices. Choices of text, choices of languages and distributions of words, grammar, styles. So it's not just about the ox on the tongue that I mentioned in the beginning. It already starts maybe with the translation of the word street. It's rue uh, in French and street in English. But I cannot translate what a French person thinks of when he hears rue. So maybe he thinks of going protesting on the street and rebellion. So you might think it's not so difficult to give another word for the same thing. But all the context that comes with this is not translatable. I told you the um, example about Hopper, I am beautiful, defining gender. History has told us extra um, examples, like the Treaty of Waitangi. I don't know who of you are familiar with it. It's between the Maori and the British colonizers. They all, they both signed, both sides signed a treaty, thinking that they signed the same thing, but actually the understanding of what it means to claim land meant something totally different for each side. And owning and selling land or claiming land as a temporary usage. And of course, we have the famous example of uh, Borges writing about the mistranslation, or the mistranslation is already a bad word, of Aristoteles and tragedy into Arabic. So how to translate the word of tragedy, which does not exist in this form, in Arabic, which has led to the whole history and many Western Europe, European countries that in Arabic there is no theater, which is not true. There's just other forms and other words for it, even if the word itself cannot be translated. So you have masa, and then you have to add different forms to it. I can only I talk about those very short. So the last question I want to pose is that what texts are translated by whom and circulated where? And what power comes with it, what power matrix? It brings up the ethical responsibility of any translation pro uh, process. Thank you. Uh, I suppose we should have some time at the end for questions, so we'll give you a question for later. Now, the second speaker, I arrange also, is Herman Andel Alteman, whose uh, that is managing the gaps, translation, transformation, relocation. We see human ambition, desire, and emotion manifest itself with the highest intensity. The debates are sharp, 
the monologues have a beauty beyond compare, and the musical power of the Mephitrici composed choral songs is overwhelming. At the same time, Greek tragedy is full of elements that may be unfamiliar to an average non-Greek spectator, and even to the artistic staff of an average non-Greek theatre company. As a consequence, translating Greek tragedy involves much more than just trying to render the original words and phrases into one's own language. The translator has to deal with a whole range of potential gaps that originate from a general lack of knowledge about the world of ancient Greek drama, notably its social, political, mythical and religious context, as well as the characteristics of ancient Greek drama texts. In this short paper, I would like to share with you how I, as a translator, try to deal with such gaps, often in close collaboration with the artistic staff of the new production or relocation of the ancient play, and that's the director, the dramaturg, the composer. And I will focus on two issues, one that is connected with tragedies, religious and mythical context, the other with a literary phenomenon that always fascinates me when I'm working on translation. I will not speak about the musical component of Greek tragedy, which I consider essential to the genre, since Alfred Chaplin will deal with this at greater length in his talk. I will conclude my contribution with a short epilogue on Greek tragedy as a source of inspiration for the composition of new theater texts. Okay, when I publish my translations in book form, I can write lengthy introductions. I can write many footnotes. And I can bridge every possible gap in this way. Without making any change to my text, to the published text. But in the theater performance, everything is different. There's no room for footnotes. There's no room for lengthy introductions. <coughs> Everything that is obscure, but essential to the meaning of the play, has to be explained or transformed in the performance text or otherwise. Now, a simple example of such a transformation that we often use uh, when we make a performance text is to uniformize the names. So, Ilion becomes Troy, Alexandros becomes Paris, Archives, Danaeans, Aegeans become Greeks. This is already a very effective aid to a theater audience that is not familiar with Asian Greek drama. But gaps management becomes much more difficult when an author introduces a whole world behind a mythical name or a place, a world that is essential to the thematic development of a play. The opening of Euripides' Suppliant. Uh, provides a clear example. In this play, the politically motivated events unfold within a religious setting, which is the sanctuary of Demeter in Elastus. A group of women and boys from Argos turn to Athens for help. Their sons and fathers have been killed in an expedition against Thebes, and now the Thebans are denying these relatives the right to bury the dead. Theseus comes to the aid and succeeds after a short battle, in returning the dead bodies to their families. The bodies are washed and cremated, and eventually the dead can rest in peace. In the closing scene of the play, Athens receives from Argos the promise of eternal gratitude, a clear political message at the time. Now, on a political level, the play discusses many sentiments that are familiar to a modern audience. But on the religious level, there, are, there appear deep gaps. This is how the play opens in ancient Greek. We hear a woman praying. After a few lines, she will introduce herself as Aithra, the mother of the Athenian king, Theseus. OK, Demeter. Demeter. This is a very simple translation. <laughs> Everybody can do it. But the next words, Estio. And uh, as you is difficult. I mean, at the start of um, at the start of this play, the vast majority of the Dutch audience will already be completely lost after the first three words. And <laughs> um, more importantly, from the outset, 
They will miss the quintessence of the setting of this play. It starts with the name Demeter, you saw it. Well, if the audience already knows in Holland that she is a Greek goddess, only very few will be able to tell you that she has to do something with props and with grain. <laughs> and hardly anyone will know that she was associated with the Eleusinian Mysteries, a cultus of the afterlife that attracted huge amounts of visitors throughout antiquity to be initiated. This second word, is complicated in itself because modern Dutch have lost the idea of the earth as the central place in the house, the essence of the household. Now, the third word, Elefsinos, with Kronos, <coughs> um, here the audience gets completely lost. When I ask my students who are not classicists, what is Elias, nobody will be able to tell you anything about it. So here we are. The original Greek spectators, and I give you the last two words as well, the place where we are. The original Greek spectators, and modern Greeks probably as well, immediately associated with the annual return of the Demeter's daughter, Persephone, from the underworld. The relevance of this setting would thrust itself upon, upon them within the first two minutes of the performance when the mothers from Argos supplicate Aitra to help them to accomplish the return of the dead sons they lost in the battle before the Thebes. It may be clear that the simple translations of these words will not suffice to render this complex context to a Dutch audience. When we produced the play in 2006 in a co-production with Michael Marinos and the Athenian Tizir Ensemble, we explained part of the context in the first lines and part at a later stage in the prologue. I will try to literally translate my Dutch informants text into English and the transformations are uh, marked in my text. So, there's your, here we are. Goddess Demeter, you who are feeding the earth, you who are protecting this ground here, Elias, dedicated to you. So we have kind of context now. Now I can tell everything in this first line, but then the audience will be lost again, because it's too much information in the first three lines of the play. So the second part of the information we gave at the later stage. Mm -hmm. Later on, in the prologue, uh, when Aitra says, I stay here at the sacred hearth of the two goddesses, Persephone and Demeter, and we had the following explanation, who preserve the mystery or the secret of life after death. And then everything is there. It's been told for once, and, and the context is there. Now, this religious and mythical context of ancient Greek uh, tragedy almost continuously uh, provides get like these. And every time again, an artistic staff has to decide whether or not to bridge these elements. Sometimes we just translate as names, almost as ornamental elements. At others, we transform them and we explain them. And when they threaten to become a real burden, we skip them from the performance text, accepting that not everything in the original play can be relocated. Other gaps appear from the linguistic and stylistic qualities of ancient Greek texts. I will point to one phenomenon that for a modern audience, and especially for the younger generation, becomes a real obstacle nowadays. <coughs> I just have to follow my uh, PowerPoint. <coughs> Greek uh, tragedians did not hesitate at writing lengthy monologues, sometimes up to 100 verses or even more. And within these monologues, they used clauses that could run over 10 verses or more. Today I will concentrate only on lengthy clauses, but much of what I say, with the necessary changes, is true for monologues as well. Before we accept that the use of lengthy clauses has become outmoded, and we decide to split them into small bits and pieces, it is worthwhile to take a closer look at the possible benefits of that. Long causes depict a world that is not governed by simple causality. 
Greek tragedy uh, tragedians used a variety of stylistic techniques that range from different types of subordination to the free use of word order to the insurgence of loose constituents, and thus they created a very complex syntactical structure, but one with remarkable consequences. A good example comes from the paradox uh, in Aeschylus' Agamemnon. The opening clause consists of 15 verses. And I will focus on the first nine. The central message is this. Tenth year, this is since Menelaus and Agamemnon, an expedition of men from Argos, put to sea. This is the main information of this clause. Now, if we look at the clause as a whole, then many things start to change. Around this central message, Aeschylus organizes clusters of additional information that often appeal to the spectator's imagination and his associative capacities. Aeschylus jumps from image to image, from perspective to perspective, as if he uses a camera. He starts with a time frame, and you can follow it in the <coughs> Then he shifts his camera to primus, and the associative image is, is Troy. Then there's a loose qualification, Megas, and we don't know about who it, this qualification is, we didn't hear the name in the house. There's a motive, Antidikos. Then the camera shifts to Menelaus, his function, Anax, with all the connotations. Then he shifts to Agamemnon. There's a characterization of the leadership, there's a focus on the throne. The image changes again to Zeus, the high power, who sanctioned, sanctioned um, the power. Then there's again a shift of focus to the scepter, which is qualified as honorable, Timis. And then there's an image of a yoke characterizing the tie between the two leaders. There's a focus on their common lineage, so the focus is on Africa. <coughs> then there's a shift of focus to the expedition, Stolon. There's a zoom in on to the sailors and the soldiers from Argos. There's a zoom out to the huge amount of ships, Gideonautem. Then there's a further zoom out to the land of Argos, the base faction. And a further zoom out to the ships sailing out under the leaderships of the brothers. Now we are at Iran. Put to see. Then there's a qualification of the expedition, and in the last line there's a zoom in on Menelaus and Agamemnon and their strong war boat, with references to Saturn. Now I will not embark on a translation of this complex clause into English, because I'm not a native speaker, uh, nor does it make any sense to read my Dutch translation here, because no one of you will understand a word of it. But I think the point is clear the use of camera technique in these long clauses. Okay, although this is uh, technically uh, the information structure is complex, the clause is well balanced and it's rich in terms of shifting images. This balance is easily disturbed when you try to split the line into smaller clauses. I used to explain to the actors that Aeschylus' language is, that is marked by discontinuity is a language of slowness. And this is true to a large extent for Sophocles and Euripides as well. And this brings me to another benefit of lengthy clauses. Well-ordered complexity is also a gift to the act. Once he or she has disentangled the clause and turned all the elements into a clear line of thought, the complexity vanishes and it creates space for variation in phrasing in foregrounding, every night again. Then suddenly these texts start to blossom at their fullest. And for me, this is the most important reason why I always aim at a similar syntactical complexity in my translations. Epilogue. Despite the gaps that we encounter when we try to relocate the Greek tragedy in the modern world, 
These ancient texts remain strong vehicles for addressing contemporary socio-political issues, <coughs> as they did in 5th century Athens. This power of Greek tragedy has forcefully been explained by the fact that the mythical world in which the human crises are set creates a distance and thus becomes a safe parallel environment for reflection. This same quality may be one of the reasons that prompted later authors to write new tragedies or to adapt acting plays and trans to transfer contemporary issues into the context of ancient Greek myth. One could call this practice reversed relocation. And it's another manifestation of how Greek tragedy as a genre may operate at the intersection of politics and performance. During my work as a translator, I have often thought about this quality of Greek tragedy in relation to current socio-political issues in the Netherlands. These thoughts resulted in 2013 in a new modern translation titled Hippos. The Netherlands at that time experienced an unprecedented rise of populism, both left and right wing. The political debate became increasingly dominated by anti-feelings, anti-Islam, anti-Europe, anti-left establishment, anti-culture, anti-globalism, anti-immigration. Clever rhetoricians propagated the glorification of the past to give Holland back to the Dutch. And the power of rhetoric, especially the rhetoric of fear and discontentment, became the main subject of illness. The play shows how, in the hands of clever speakers, a confrontation between democratic ideas and anti-democratic sentiments may end up in a deep impasse, cause great social turmoil, and ultimately may even be to save the war. Material for the elaboration uh, of this subject was provided by the political situations in Athens around 404 BC when the Athenian democratic system was temporarily suspended and a band of 30 anti-democrats under the leadership of Critias uh, seized power. Political murders, large-scale confiscations followed and many Athenian democrats were exiled. This regime of terror ruled for half a year when it was defeated by an army of democratic exiles under the leadership of Thrasyphus. I have always been struck by the fact that a rather stable political system <coughs> like the Athenian democracy could be annihilated within a period of only a few months by a group of people using clever rhetoric to disguise their true intentions. By relocating the Dutch political situations in an ancient mythical context based on the final scene of Sophocles' women's <coughs> office and mixing it with the historical events of 404 BC, as well as with images from the rise and suppression of modern democratic movements, I tried to create a distant world for reflection. Spectators were deprived of their preconceived ideas about current Dutch politicians. Instead, they were invited to judge in a conflict between strangers on the basis of arguments. A conflict in which democratic and anti-democratic sentiments had both their appealing and their abhorrent sides. And this is what Greek tragedy is capable of, despite the fact that it sometimes creates deep gaps. It goes to the heart of being human. It shakes you out of your comfort zone. And it's a sea of inspiration that appeals to the deepest levels of your creativity. So let's continue to study them, to translate them, to tra perform them, to transform them, or to mirror them, because it's worthwhile. Thank you.
first time to speak uh, the title Attempting to Translate the Orestia with Ms. Rhythm and meter and deviation, 
the voice and its pacing, the need for diction decorous enough, yet not so antique as to sound out of time, and not a more contemporary idiom, all the fleeting, fitful anxieties that affect the literary translator. And uh, I can see Herbert and I share, very much share, all the fleeting, fitful anxieties that affect the literary translator. Well, I have had the huge uh, pleasure, if only for just purely self-centered hedonism, uh, of translating the Oristan um, in the last the recent years. And it came out last year, uh, published by Norton in New York, both as, an, as a Norton critical edition. This has a lot of pedagogic uh, material with it. It has some notes at the bottom of the page, um, uh, <clears throat> scholarly uh, extracts and scholarly articles. But Norton also brought it out in this Livrite edition, which actually I have to say has sold better, um, which is more for the for the general public and is uh, shorn of, of the pedagogic uh, material. Now my priorities, as I say, it's all a matter of priorities. My priori I have tried as my priorities to bring out what I would say is the musicality and the color of Eastlers, at the same time, at the same time, to try to bring out the theatricality, so that this is good for action and good for hearing. You know, we always talk about speakability, but also it must be good for hearing, as well as good for speaking. And I have, for better or for worse, made, paid special attention to what I would call metrical registers, to to metric to the type to the levels to the types of measure of meter, and here my my key quote, uh, which I <coughs> think entire quotation by um, uh, Brodsky, Josip Brodsky, the um, Russian uh, poet who fled to the United States. Um, he, he was reviewing a new translation of Mandelstam in 1974, and Brodsky wrote, a translator should begin his work, or her work, a translator should begin their work, I think we would now say. A translator should begin their work, and translating is a very good interval. <laughs> uh, a translator should begin their work with a search for at least a metrical equivalent of the original form with a search for at least a metrical equivalent of the original form. Now, equivalent, here is the key term. What, what is an, an equivalence? Translating from ancient Greek poetry and verse into a modern language, into English in particular, we are translating from a metric that was arranged by quantity, by the length of the syllables. This was the metric of ancient Greek. The length of the syllables was what underlay the metric. Whereas for English, and indeed for modern Greek, the metric is a metric of stress. So immediately, you are looking for an equivalence between quantity, the length, length of syllables, and the and the stress of syllables. It's not the same thing. It's not at all the same thing. And it makes you realize that every language has different associations of rhythm, different associations of sound patterns, different um, um, uh, metrical histories, uh, so that patterns and sounds and rhythms and meters uh, carry different associations in different languages. So this is something you can't say, uh, uh, there is no universal rule, uh, because this is so different for the different languages it's being translated into. Now for, for better or for worse, in my English translation, I, I have three uh, main metrics. Uh, and I picked, actually, if you'd like to distribute this handout, uh, um, the 
please don't, please don't bother with the handout, it's really a souvenir. Um, I, I, pick, I picked a passage uh, from towards the end of the Apollemnon. The end of the... Um, I'm sorry, I should have put this before. Uh, there, there, has been, there has been the great after the murder, after the killing of Agamemnon and Cassandra, there is this great confrontation between Clytemnestra, 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 Sardinia, Clytemnestra, Clytemnestra, and uh, the chorus. Okay. Um, and I pick this passage because it contains my three main methods. The iambics of the spoken, the iambic of Trinita, the 12 or 13, 14 syllable line of the Greek. The anapistic meter, which is the least common and is quite common in the old and lyric meters. Uh, now, in, to, to start, and you have there the passages with the, um, the very respectable lower classical text of uh, Alan Summerskin. Uh, you have the Greek uh, translation by uh, Dimitris Dimitriadis, uh, and, you, uh, and you have my translation. I'm not sure so slight for some of these passages. Now, it so happens that in English, by good fortune, the iambic meter, which Aristotle, Aristotle in the Poetics describes as malister lecticon, especially speakable, uh, that also in English, the basic, most speakable meter is, is iambic. It is not difficult to make up English in iambic meters. All you have to do is keep along. You can say whatever you may wish. It usually, it, uh, it often falls into iambic meter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but there is also in English a great tradition of blank verse, the ten syllable line, almost, almost like Sepphiris waking up with a marble head. Uh, that, that uh, Shakespeare, Milton, Wordsworth, Tennyson, all use the blank verse meter, and I decided that I couldn't, I could, I couldn't try uh, that it were a mistake to try to use the blank verse. Uh, maybe that was a mistake. Mistake. Maybe I should have. It would have given me more form. But instead, I used variable line length. And I've tried to introduce some syncopations and irregularities, uh, but I hope that my lies have under them an iambic pulse. So before looking at the lines of Odysseus here, let me just, so you can just hear, without, without the Greek text, um, let me just read you a, a little passage. This is Clytemnestra immediately when she appears with the dead bodies. So she stands over the dead bodies and she starts to make a defense to the old men and then she says, here, here I am, I did it. <clears throat> I offer no apology for saying things that contradict what I have said before to suit the moment. How else if you're planning harm against your enemies who think they're friends, how else are you to rid the trap of nets too high to be escaped by leaping over them? My mind has long been working out this final contest in my long-drawn feud, and now at last it has arrived. I stand here where I struck with what I did in front of me. So I hope you can hear the the pulse, but it is not, uh, it's, not a, it's, a, it's not tight. So looking 
simply not. Yes, so this passage, I don't know if you just want to look at the Dimitriadis to make sure that you, or, or the Summerstein uh, translation. Um, so this is, Aegisthus arrives and breaks up the confrontation with the Prime Minister and, and, and the courts. And my translation goes like this. I greet you, welcome light of day, that brings me justice. I can say at last that gods look down from high upon the crimes of earth and make sure humans pay the price, since now I see this man here lying in the woven cloths of the arenas and paying for the plot his father <laughs> perpetrated. So, Pleistonese, 
who is Python? Even the commentators don't know who the hell Python is. Uh, so uh, I, I translated that as the diamond of this bloodline. But again, you know, I used the word diamond very, very deliberately because I couldn't think of a better way of saying it. So finally, let me come to lyric. This is the most challenging, the most various, almost half of the Aristarchus in lyric meters. And this is what I found the greatest and most fascinating challenge of all. <coughs> now, I place myself here uh, as a, an academic who tries to write back for us uh, in, in, in my time, but within my own time, uh, after the free verse, uh, modernism and free verse, the age of Eliot, the age of Seferis, um, there has in English been a movement back towards some form, towards form. Uh, and here I've been influenced by two giants who show that they're trying to climb on uh, Seamus Heaney and Tony Harrison. Mm -hmm. And they both made use of, of stanza forms, uh, particularly perhaps ballad stanza forms, and of rhyme. Um, and I have made use of rhyme, or actually more accurately to say I made use of half rhyme, half rhyme, quarter rhyme, sound echoes. <clears throat> so I've only used absolutely direct rhymes where there is some point in its landing, direct. Otherwise, I've tried to use um, sound echoes, uh, sound patterns. Um, and I've often, made, I've usually been, either the, these have been arranged in couplets or in quatrains. This is um, the great poets of English who write much longer, say Keats, writes much longer sense of things. But, uh, four lines is about as much as I can manage. Um, and, um, I will just first, uh, before I look at the stanza uh, here, let me read you a stanza once again so you can just hear it with, without um, having the Greek in front of you. Uh, Agamemnon has gone into the palace treading on the purple cloths. And there is the most wonderful four, four stanza chorus, uh, where the chorus tangled with what has happened. It starts wide as this clinging dread overcast me with four early. And the last stanza, let me just read you this, it's quite closely, the rhymes here are closer than my usual, in arranged A, B, A, B. So, uh, uh, as the rhyme scheme, do you understand what I mean when I say A, B, A, B? <coughs> and as I've translated all of these lyrics, I've tried to think of them as, as song. I've tried to think how wonderful it would be if a composer could make music out of these. I, just to be sentimental for a moment, uh, some years ago I did a, a, a Getty Museum in, in, uh, in California and then in Oxford in London, a, a, a show called Swallow Song with Lydia Corneoglu. She directed it, and um, and Takis Farazis wrote uh, music, um, and his most beautiful. It was one of the great pleasures of my life to hear his setting of my <coughs> verses to music. <clears throat> so let me just read you this stanza, the last, the fourth stanza uh, after the poem. <clears throat> Once blood has spurted black and soaked the ground with death. There's none can chant it back to life from the stained earth. An overriding fate holds back those who transgress, a warning that my heart should make clear with full voice. It lurks in dark instead and murmurs in its pain and can't unwind the thread. Meanwhile, my mind's aflame. So you can hear the kind, that, that as I say, is, is titled musical. Um, but uh, with the, the deliberate close rhymes that it comes to the end of the stanza. And if we now just take the, the choral stanza, um, that is there in front of you, is it? Yes, on the 
Okay. So uh, the the one that in the in the Dimitriadis uh, goes in the end probably a policy finale. In the discolo in Aquinas. So again, uh, I'd like to hear this in music. And I hope I've given some musicality to the, to the language. Damnation meets the condemnation back. To judge is difficult. The plunderer gets plundered in his turn. The payer, the killer, pays for guilt. Yet this remains as long as Zeus remains upon his throne secure. Who does the deed must suffer for the deed. That's the eternal law. Who can eliminate the seed, expel the household curse at last? This family and dire catastrophe are bloomed together fast. So you, you see, I have, I have these partial rhymes. To judge is difficult, the killer pays for guilt. Upon his throne secure, that's the eternal law. The household curse at last are glued together fast with a full rhyme for that final one because it's glued together fast. Now, I'm told, I've been told in this in several modern languages, that rhyme is impossible. But in, uh, uh, in Italian, I told in, in French, you can't use rhyme in a modern translation because rhyme is archaic. I've heard this said in, in Greece as well. Rhyme has a kind of old-fashioned, 19th century uh, feel about it, and the, the, the days of rhyme are over. Now, my last point is just to say, I wonder about that when I see that popular song in almost all languages makes great use of rhyme. <laughs> and what was the popular song in 5th century Greece? How is it that the Athenians, who were the slaves in the stone quarries of Syracuse, won their freedom? By teaching the Syracusans the lyrics of Euripides. Uh, what is it that the old men, so Aristophanes tells us, would sing as they walk along the road? They would sing the old lyrics of Phrynichos. The popular song of 5th century Athens was the lyrics of tragedy. And uh, so I think that I, I would like to think that the musicality of rhyme in languages as well as English, in other languages, also has potential for composers, potential for holding together the poetry of the original. So again, this is a matter of priority. It's a matter of making a priority of musicality. Thank you. Uh, you are a bit out of time at the end, uh, but uh, maybe uh, we have some time for discussion. Uh, so, any questions? Or ideas? Or whatever has been discussed on the field? Or maybe you are very tired with the heat and heat. Yes, please. Right. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> thank you for a wonderful paper. But uh, it seems that for every translation, there has to be a production and a director who can make full use of that translation. For instance, what you demonstrated uh, in your translation needs a director who can really employ music and sing out the portions, not only of the chorus, yeah. but also the musicality of the, of the dialogue. Yeah. And as you know, in the ancient times, the dialogue was not ever just uh, conversationally rendered, but it was in two, three ways, you know, Parakatarumi and this and that. So it was very, very musical as compared to our understanding of dialogue, right? Yeah, yes. Um, Absolutely, and the, the, um, 
the reason why I agreed to do this with Norton is although what they wanted is, you know, a book that would sell to um, uh, Great Literature 101. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I said to them, I will only do this. I, 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 I was fortunately able to say this. I, I will only do this if I can produce a performance text. Uh, and that meant, I mean, there are many places where I've uh, cut lines, where uh, obscurities, which I've not, you know, I've, I've tried to produce a text that does not need footnotes, that does not need explanation, that can be read out loud, that can be performed out loud. And uh, they let me do this. They said, you don't have to produce a, a, a totally close uh, translation. Uh, absolutely, I mean, uh, I, I'm glad you said that because this is what I was working with the whole time, working with the aspiration, the aspiration of performance. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then, uh, uh, should such a text, Professor, should such a text uh, make use of uh, past illustrations as well to, uh, to make an addition? Uh, that's an, uh, I miss I miss the uh, the the way that uh, you use the bad illustrations. Yes. yes. Well, the, these um, uh, you know usually you read in books that we don't know anything about what the original looked like. Well, we have a, 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 a lot of paintings from the next century, painted by the Greeks uh, in uh, Megalia now in uh, uh, Magna Grecia, um, which show, uh, give us a very good idea of, 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 of uh, costumes and props and so on. But, um, and I wrote a book about this. Oh, two. <laughs> one, one for comedy and one for tragedy. But I, no, I can't, I can't possibly say to a designer, you, you must try to produce ancient Greek costumes. That's impossible. <clears throat> What I would say to a designer is just have a look at these pictures, they may give you some ideas. <coughs> um, and um, so, just as the translation cannot be a, 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 a museum translation, so the design can't be a museum design, I think. But it's something to feed into the mix. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver, so much. Um, uh, an ignorant question about your use of trochaic verse. Uh, and I say it's ignorant because I'm uh, not, you know, an expert, an, an expert in, on English metrics at all. My, my impression is that uh, the trochaic rhythm has a light-heartedness that may not be there in the original. I mean, I am reminded of that famous scene in Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, where they rehearse a play and the, you know, the butler recounts the Count's sexual exploits in, uh, in, uh, in uh, um, the trochaic verse. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, we all know that Aristotle says that the, the trochaic verse is more appropriate to, to uh, comical mm -hmm. and, and, and dancing, <coughs> dancing drama than, than uh, the serious drama that is tragedy. But then, as I said, it may, it may well be that you know, English poetry has its, its precedence for, for the use of trochaic verse in yes. more serious context. Yes. I think, um, I mean, in some ways, uh, the, the thing that it makes uh, people think of most in English is, is Hiawatha <laughs> or the Kalevala. Mm. <coughs> now, I mean, I think in some ways I had the Kalevala mm -hmm. uh, rhythm behind behind it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it any longer has your genos. I mean, it's very nice for genos uh, uh, allusion, um, but I don't think it any longer has that kind of frivolity. Mm. Um, and I, uh, but of course, you know, if, if I say the Kalevala. Uh, Rhythm, the Hiawatha rhythm has, has influenced me. Again, that's not something that audiences will pick up. But I, I tried to, um, as the Anapi, as the original, as the Anapis did, particularly spoke, um, uh, or what I might call chanting Anapis rather than not lyric Anapis, um, can be a marching rhythm. Mm -hmm. So 
I wanted to try and have something that had a, a, a kind of pace. Uh, but it, it's a difficult one, because I, I, I experimented with anapistes in English. Anapistes don't work in English. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm not saying 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 i am not I say this because I did a version of the Aristide called the Bloodstream at the Palace Theatre in Edinburgh. And I set the three acts in different periods of modern history. The first one was set in the time of the Second World War, and the language was pure Mel Cal. Mm -hmm. And the second one was set in the kind of 1950s, so the language was kind of pinter. Mm -hmm. That's why the boy comes back and kills his mother. And then finally, the, um, the, the last act was in a kind of limbo land um, of, of uh, quite modernist, but, yeah. but um, looking, to, looking to the future. Um, how far do you go? Yeah. Bringing um, in modern religion. Um, just also, just to say, um, the production of Peter Stein, which yeah. we saw, did modernize itself gradually through the acts. Yeah. So that in the end, um, you were in a television studio, and Athene was um, the anchor woman who was um, Judging the yeah. Yeah. situation. Well, it, I mean, um, I'm still, it sounds very interesting over <laughs> uh, And um, the Venter Stein, which, um, uh, which Astrid was talking about, uh, used different uh, levels of uh, addiction. But I think it, it never got. There's a problem with colloquiality, I think, you know, when you're translating tra tragedy, at least if you're translating tragedy. With my uh, background in the scholarship of tragedy, which I can't get rid of, I, I, I have to live with it. It's, it's in my blood. Um, but um, and that uh, Aeschylus fiction uh, has colloquial elements, but it's not consistently colloquial. It's comedy. It's Aristophanes, but it's consistently colloquial. So. Um, I, I think it's a false, uh, as usual, a false dichotomy. Nearly all the dichotomies in translation itself is, are false dichotomies. Close, distant, domesticated, foreignized, um, colloquial, or artificial. Completely false dichotomy. Um, but I, I don't have a lot of colloquialism just because I, I'm reflecting the Eastern, the Eastern language. But I, would not to stop you or anyone <laughs> else. <laughs> Maybe I'll uh, have yes. a large yes. yes. about that. Do you want to come and say to Maybe you should come also to the end of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So would you like to add something? Uh, or uh, comment? Or, uh, well, yeah. It's on the last point, that, uh, I think, talking about uh, colloquialism. Um, I agree, uh, you, don't, you don't need this uh, dichotomy, but um, I think the most important thing in translating, whatever choice you make, whether you try to remain, as you talk about, very close to the original or not, in the end, it depends on, on the capacity of the actors to be able to make it sound colloquial. That's the thing, that's what it's talking about. I mean, you can write a translator, you can write a very difficult syntactical structure in your lines if it's syntactically um, uh, all right, then a good actor is able to work with it. So, I don't believe in things like uh, colloquialism or, or, or trying to to, to bring things very close. It's, I have to bring my text close to the actors. That's what it's about. And I have to trust the actors that they will be able to work with it. Because they are the ones who are going to tell it to the audience. I'm not going to tell it to the audience. That's why I make a performance text. And that's why I make a, public, a publicated text that, okay, can be very close. I can keep everything in it. I don't have to make it good for them. 
and maybe put one last thing on it, because text is only one part of the theme performance, right? So it is, uh, depending on the performance, there's much more, there's physicality, we have light, we have music, not only in the text, and speaking of the text, but maybe playing music on the scene, maybe senses, smell. So um, this can also portray something that could look, uh, could look perfectly meaning making it clear for the audience to understand. So it's not only on the text level, but there are any other devices to do this. This makes me feel that text is the wrong word. Exactly. Everybody talks about text, 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 and in, I'm afraid in modern Greek, this terrible word here, yeah. so which is so, uh, so passive. Yeah. As fast as yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, when they're talking theatre, you know, yeah. text, yeah. text is, oh. as you said, text is the wrong it's, word. It's one yeah. part of, yeah. the whole, yeah. of the whole performance. Yeah. 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 Uh, that was fun, that was uh, thank you all uh, for your presentations. Um, I think that uh, the word, the Greek word for text, kimeno, is much richer than we tend to take it to be. Kimeno, hypokimeno, antikimeno, there is a whole wealth of meanings, related meanings, that can lead the way to an issue that is not or was not brought up here, namely, whether you want to talk about text turned into performance, text and performance or whatever, the key word is culture. The culture of the translator is not necessarily the culture of the performer. If you change the nation, state, the country, then I was wondering, would your, perhaps, your meticulous framework with the metrics and everything would be applied in a, say, face-to-face -face society, a society we call tribal society. Face-to-face -face society. If they have different perspective, different perspective of how to con connect oral discourse to ceremonial practices. Or for that matter, going into a different example, like, say, Japanese culture. Would your framework be used in such a case, or we have to face a different reality in terms of rendering an old piece, however defined, into a modern performance? Okay. I just want to, that's why I use the, that's why I put the emphasis on the word equivalent. I didn't say equivalent. No, no I said equivalent. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, in so many different circumstances, you are looking for an equivalent, and equivalence is not is not static, not culturally uh, uniform. Yes. And I think each of us really very much stressed the fact that a translation is done for a specific performance, a specific context, all of us did that. For you it was the presentation of a book that is readable, or the text is readable. You've done it for a presentation, I uh, said it for Peter Stein. So this way it's always done for a specific audience, specific participants, actors, and then there is no general, general translation that can be adapted to any cultural context, but it's also always very specific, I would say. If you permit me a comment, I always was uh, pretty bad with the difference between the word kimeno and the word text. And uh, the word kimeno is very, very restrictive. It talks about something which lies, which is probably dead. And then you need to revive it, which is the feeling that we have to answer when we talk about revival. Mm -hmm. The word text is much more open. Uh, the relation between theater and text. Uh, the idea of the texture which is behind is much more open, open and much more adapted to what can be a performance. Then but the text is the idea of the life. I'm sorry. The thing is that text is on paper. It's on paper. Yeah. Yeah. But the word quotation, the word email, the quotation, the word text is much more. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Another interesting idea is that sometimes we use the word original instead of the text. And that is a discussion about ideology, especially in Greece, for example, the, the word original, when we use it for a text of tragedy, puts a frame of an ideological world, maybe, or priorities, that for me is very dangerous. For the tragedy and the text, everybody is, uh, spoke about texts and not originals. What word do you use for original? Um, I use it like yeah. Prototypo, it's something like prototypo, it's uh, the Proto idea of something prototypo, but uh, something like the Bible, that is holy and you cannot touch it. There is no song, no tone and no dance without the sound. Hence this entire universe is enveloped with the cosmic sound. The verse from Vedeshwari of the Sega Matanga, a 6th century Sanskrit text on musicology, is being used here as traditional benedictory verse and is highlighted the interconnections between the song, the dance with the primordial cosmic sound a theme which we wish to explore through this article. In Indian tradition, the relation between dance and music are established psychologically. There is a close relation between sound and sight. Music is auditory field and auditory field and dance, the visual. The potential link between dance and music highlighting the emotional experience. The traditional Indian texts speak very high of cosmic sound of the absolute that is or the anahat nag speak which is closely related to perceptible sound or the ahat nag and through the sensuous medium of shruti tone and swara note of the raga a melodic framework one can reach closer to seeing the absolute the Indian music traces its roots back to the Vedic literature, the earliest known corpus of knowledge available to us. The Vedas are chiefly divided into four complete Samhitas, namely Rig Veda, Yaju Veda, Sam Veda, and the Athar Veda. The Vedas have been handed down from one generation to another through the medium of oral instructions, that is, the teacher used to impart knowledge to the Vedas to his disciple orally and disciple would memorize the entire corpus without any written medium and would attain mastery over it. Then the disciple would in due course of time become master and would train the younger generation. This is the backdrop of Vedic chanting. The memorization processes entitled a lot of scientific steps and methods that would ensure the oral transmission of the huge corpus literature happens with the highest amount of accuracy which were embedded in the chanting techniques. There is a particular way in which these 
comp compilations are to be recited and the UNESCO has inscribed the Vedic chanting as the intangible cultural heritage of humankind. The IGNC plays a vital role in getting its recognition. And this is the polio from the Sharda manuscripts of the Veda. So among the four above mentioned Vedas, Sam Veda is believed to have been the source of Indian music. Sam Veda, interestingly, is the shortest of all the Vedas. The total number of verses in the Sam Vedas is 1875. Amongst these, 177 <coughs> verses are from the Rig Veda, and only 99 verses of this Samhita are not found in Deering, thus regarded to be the Sam Veda itself. The text of Rig Veda is not used in its original form for singing in the Sam Veda, but certain changes were introduced to adopt it to singing. There were six versities of vocal inflection that are mentioned that transformed the times of the Rig Veda to be regarded as altogether new Vedas. Uh, this is the folio uh, from the Nagari script in 1672 of Samveda. The journey of the original and de origin and development of Indian music can be traced back from the emergence of concept of tones and tunes along with rhythm. The emergence of tones and tunes were made possible by microtones and their arrangements. This, along with the evolution of registers and scales, Perception and consonances and dissonances, emergence of concept of the melodies, that is raga, and their classifications, evolution of architecture of Indian music, the manifestation of different musical phases and compositions, the evolution of instruments like drum, flute, and lute, etc., along with the question of origin of mela or melakrata masculine and feminine characters of the ragas and the evolution of contemplative compositions are some of the distinctive features of the study of history of Indian music. The evidences of practice of music and dance have been obtained in abundance in the archaeological excavations of different ancient sites of Indian peninsula. In one of the excavated figures, a drum-like instrument is seen hanging to the neck and some uh, pictographs of new straightened instruments are seen. In Roper, on the banks of River Sutlej, a statue of lady playing a four-string instrument was excavated along with the many pictorial references to, the, to a variety of musical instruments. Among other finds, flute, a harp with string and percussion instruments have also been found, which shows people of the people of the bygone era were aware of these instruments, that is Banshi, Veena, and Mridanga. You can see the rock art depicted the Nataraja dancing. It's a, it's a costume uh, and another with a large headgear. This is the depiction. This is the rock art playing harp. This is the lady which, uh, which is available, uh, uh, which is uh, maybe 5,000 to 10,000 years old. Uh, this is the sculpture of a lady looking at the mirror. This is again a uh, dancing pose. With the advent of the time, the vocal instruments section of Indian music gained due gravitas, which is reflected in the strong textual tradition of India and is manifested in the rich Indian cultural tradition as well. This is the this is this tradition which we can see. The earlier treatise that we get as major evidence of Indian the Indian theatre is the Natya Shastra or a treatise of theatre, a compodium composed between 200 BC to 200 AD, and the authorship of this treatise is attributed to Bharata Muni. We have Professor Bharat Bhut, who is an eminent scholar on this, so I need not to elaborate much on the Natya Shastra. This treatise is the first foremost and most complete work of dramatology that is available to us till date. It is 36 chapters or 37 and it comprises about 6,000 verses uh, and notes in, and, and notes in prose style and verses. It addresses almost all aspects related to a performance such as acting, dance, dramatic construction, architecture, Costuming, makeup, props, the organization of companies, the audience, etc., quite exhaustively. Such is the lenses of the topics it covers, 
that is in the first chapter itself the text proudly proclaims i quote there is no knowledge no craft no science no art no combination and no action that does not fall within the purview of the theater that is natya the text begins with the legendary account of the origin of theater as to how the theater came into being in doing so it provides indications about the nature of actual theatrical practices it can be certainly premised that when the natya shastra was being composed the composer had sanskrit theater as a model in front of him because as he clearly mentions as to how the different characters of the play should be using different extant languages or dialects the text further prescribes that the performance is to be done on some scale sick sacred ground trained by professionals in a hereditary manner it e its aim was both to educate as well as to entertain an appreciation for the stage craft and classical sanskrit drama was seen as an essential part of the sophisticated world view by the end of the 7th century under the patronage of royal courts performers belonged to professional companies that were directed by stage managers that is known as sutradar who may also have acted this task was thought of as being analogous that of a puppeteer a literal meaning of sutradara is holder of the strings or threads the performers okay okay <laughs> <laughs> the performers were trained rigorously in vocal and physical techniques there were no prohibitions against female performers companies were well were all male or female and of mixed gender some performers played characters their own age while others played ages different from their own all of all the other elements of theater the treatise gives most attention to abhinaya uh, and conventional conventional through major focuses of the latter its drama is regarded as the highest achievement of theater sanskrit literature it utilizes strong characters such as hero that is naika heroine that is naika and the gestures that is vidushaka this is the icon of uh, bharat muni and uh, i will not go in detail about the natya shastra but only to tell that the natya shastra has uh, uh, divided into 36 chapters out of which chapter 4 8 9 10 11 12 21 22 25 and 26 talk about various kinds of dance related themes at length and from 28 to 33 the text dialogues upon the different aspects of music both of which together give rise to complete experience of performance of theater the stage craft and associated themes which are described in chapter 2 3 5 6 and 7 i would also like to tell you about a few pictures which also give you some of the four forms which relate to dance and drama in the theater this picture is is from a performance known as bhand pather which which is being performed in the northern part of india which again ignc has documented as the world heritage documentation and you can see uh, the the theatrical elements as well as the music and dance element on this uh this is the kuriyattam of kerala which is which is again a very beautiful example of uh, music dance and theatrical style uh, which gives you a complete uh, sight of a complete uh, theatrical performances uh, it is performed in kerala uh this is again dandiya ras of gujarat uh, which uh, which is uh, which is on the western part of india and it again uh, deals with the dance movements as well as music as well as the the, the traditional style of theatrical art uh this is the northeast part which where manipur is situated and manipuri dance is again another example of uh, of musical dance theater everything combined into it these are all folk forms initially but now later they have been graduated into just another 2 minutes and i'll finish that is why i am i am i am running uh, i am running very fast 
so, so I just wanted to show the slides so that uh, the learned audience, I mean, they are all learned so they can grab what I want to say. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is Satriya dance from Assam. Again, this is a theatrical form, and this combines beautifully the music, dance, and the theater within it. Uh, this is another Chow. This is also famous for its masks, which are prominent masks and very elegant masks. And uh, uh, that is again a very strong theatrical uh, performance as far as the dance and music is concerned. This is of course the Bharatanatyam of Tamil Nadu, which uh, we know that most of us in, in Greece also some of the some of the well-known exponents of Bharatanatyam are here uh, in Greece also. So you can very well see that this is also a form of dance and the music combined. And this is the most prominent theatre form. This is the Yakshagana of Karnataka. This again has been documented as a prominent form of music and dance combined in theatre. It has been done through traditions and it is a very strong uh, costume drama uh, played, played throughout the night, if not night, maybe six, seven, eight hours of play and that's a great performance. This is like another Yakshagana performance. This is the Kuchipudi. It is like another uh, dance form which is combined with the music and the theatre drama. Basically, this is also a drama form uh, from the Andhra Pradesh. This is the southern part of India. So, I mean, you can see that, uh, I mean, a lot of music, dance and uh, things which are there. And uh, you can see the iconic temple of... Uh, and this is Ankhya Nat. I'll just finish in just one, one more slide and I'll just complete. This is Ankhya Nat of Assam which also deals with the uh, theatrical performances. I just wanted to show uh, that these all performances which have been done in the different parts of the country, this is Jatra from Bengal, they all are also the strong classical forms of Indian theatre which also deal uh, with, the, with the kind of classical theatre which is being done in Greece with a lot of music and dance into it. So, so lot of commonalities there. We have texts like Ramayana, we have texts like Mahabharata, we have texts uh, like Raja Harish Chitra, where the dilemma between the, between the social cause and the um, eternal cause is always created among the characters and one has to choose between the social and the eternal cause and uh, they, they all are beautifully depicted in all our traditional dance forms. I will not uh, um, extend my time. Thank you very much. Whatever I could tell you, within the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Joshi, for having us to remain within the time frame rather to make up for the delay. And now it's my pleasure to invite by to the podium Dr. Bharat Gupt, who, as uh, everyone in this room would know, I imagine, is a classicist, a theater theorist, and uh, a scholar of classical Indian and Greek drama. Dr. Gupt. Kiryas Kekir, Karimera Apuria. I'm very glad to be here. And whenever I come to Greece, it rejuvenates me one way or another. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about Auntie Bonnie. And would I have to say a few words? I have titled this way Transcending <coughs> the Human for Divine. Transcending the Human for Divine. So, and I describe this as an Indo European idea. Now, why do I say Indo European? Is because uh, the ancient Indian concept 
about just about everything, in many ways is so similar to the very ancient Greek concepts, uh, which you find in very well preserved in the texts of Homeros. And that can be compared, and you can see that in every aspect there has been a great similarity. And I see this transcending all the human towards the divine in that context. Uh, you know, you were mentioning, Pablo's about the cultural aspect of the world. So this is exactly how the different meaning comes in. And this morning, Professor uh, Taplin, Oliver Taplin, mentioned about priority in every text. Every text or every production or every translation has a priority and it is the priority of the meaning behind the text or let's not use the word text but all the total performance in everything. So in that respect Antigone represents a world in which when there is a conflict, a seeming conflict, I mean, it's not a real conflict, but it is a conflict which is presented before a person and the person is challenged to resolve that conflict by choosing a course of action. That is, that's essentially ethos, which Aristotle puts it. What do you choose as your character, as your choice? So that choice and purpose shows how you relate to the divine. And what is the priority? Now that is the real conflict as you know of Antigone. You also mentioned this thing. The present day productions or translations or performances that I know of from different parts of the world in the last, let's say, 30, 40 years, and the translations made, they have changed the purpose, as it seems to me, of the ancient play. There is a greater priority, insistence upon the human concerns. Whether those concerns are defined as the right of the individual, Antigone is saying, well, this is the way how I feel, and this is my choice. Or it is defined as a uh, feminist right, you know, a statement of womanhood, or it is in terms of not just freedom and womanhood, but in, uh, in terms of rebellion, social rebellion, or putting an alternate idea that the state need not observe what the final authority of this, that the person, individual, need not observe or stick to what has been dictated by the state. And in all these, in the present times, we talk more about the right of the individual, the right of the social system, the right of the group, maybe the feminist group, or maybe a group representing a certain social class. So, true to maybe the modern way of thinking, it is the human that becomes more important. And it is the human that is made a priority and as a, a reason for watching the play, investigating the play, producing the play as to how the human is important and the state is a target of rebellion but there is very little awareness of the fact that in the ancient play, 
the individual is committed neither to the individual, the single individual, the person, the personality, nor to the state, but more committed to the divine. More committed because finally, even Creon is made to admit that he had made a mistake. The tragedy comes about because he's too full of himself. He equates himself with the state. He equates himself with the power of the state. And that is of course ground enough for writing or producing plays in which you show the rebellion of the individual or human rights or individual rights, etc. But the most important thing that the playwright presents very clearly is also the right of the individual, the right of the individual to perform the rituals which are dictated by the divine law. You see, now this is something which is rather difficult for the modern audience to understand. And that's, that's what I want to talk about a little more. For the modern audience, it is difficult to understand how the eternal law, or let us say the law of gods, or what has been there as, uh, as law or diki or justice, is something which has to be not has to be followed, but is the identity, following that is the identity of the individual itself. Now this is the distance that has happened between the ancient world and the modern world, contemporary world. Here perhaps, I mean you may call me a old fogey or a classicist or somebody who looks upon ancient societies in a different way. But my argument is always very simple. That ancient societies had an identity. They had a, a force of life. They had choices. And if we are going to perform something or if we are going to revisit any of their uh, texts or any of their ancient uh, plays, then what is important for us is to understand how they thought and what they stood for. And that is much more important than trying to judge them in terms of the values of modernity. Because I think, more or less sometimes, and perhaps as an anthropologist you would be able to see this very clearly, that there is a presumption in modern times, not just in the so-called West, but everywhere in the East also, that people today are most enlightened, that we are the best informed, we are the best equipped, we have the a vision of history, we know just about everything. And so if we visit it, let us say if we visit through a play, let's say the Athens of late 5th century BC, then we are just trying to look around and see, and see how they fall short of our men. See, how they fall short of our men. Now, I think this needs to be reversed. It's far more important. Yeah, I'll take just two minutes. I think it is far more important to understand what was the priority. Because that's going to help our society. From India, I come to Greece to learn something about here. See, then I can take back home something valuable. So if I visit a text of 500, 600 BC, 
then let me see what is the most important thing there. And the whole argument of the play, which of course begins in transgression and the horror of making a transgression, but which has the vigor of rebellion from both sides, oppression of the state represented by Creon and Anti Homi as somebody who is acting against it, not just speaking, but acting. Because she, she does the act right in the, you know, in the second or third uh, scenes. That comes to be proved as the right thing, quote unquote right, at the end. So that is the essential message of the play. And I think while we may choose our own methods of production with plenty of music or little music or this um, kind of uh, costume or that, the main purpose should be to understand that what is cosmic? What is big? And what is greater is far more important than the human, which is small. I mean, that's the feeling we get, at least I get, when I sit in a, sit in a Greek amphitheater. Because everything which is on the land is small. But above that is the big, you know, the star and the sky and the cosmos and the sea, very often a sea behind a theater. And that physically represents the cosmos. So it is the humans trying to understand the cosmic, which is the Indo-European, and which is relating the human to the divine. Our next speaker is Professor uh, Pablo Scavoras, who is a, a professor of musical studies here at the uh, University of Athens, and he's a specialist in uh, cultural anthropology and ethnomusicology, and he's going to be talking about consciousness and power, the role of myth in ancient Greek drama. Professor Scavoras. Hello. Thank you all for being here. It's an honor. Um, Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher, being influenced by the translation done by Hilderlin of Sophocles' Antigone, he spoke many times about Antigone, the significance of the play. We owe to him three, what I call them, caveats. Caveat number one is what in Greek it is called the tradition of epikleros, the epiclery. Heidegger focuses on Antigone's legal and political status within the palace, her privilege to be the hearth according to the legal instrument of the epiclerate, and thus she is protected by Zeus. According to the legal practice in classical Athens, Creon is obliged to marry his closest relative, which is Emon, to the late king's daughter in what is called an inverted marriage rite, which uh, would oblige Hemon to produce a son and heir for his dead father-in-law. Creon would be deprived of grandchildren and heirs to his lineage, a fact 
which provides a strong, realistic motive for his hatred against Antigone. This is a very, very important issue. Heidegger was the first to draw our attention to this issue. It explains his immense hatred against uh, Antigone. Covet number two, the essence of humanity. In his Ode on Man and Sophocles' Antigone, Heidegger focuses on the chorus sequence of strophe and antistrophe, line 278, where the chorus says that there are many strange things on earth, but nothing stranger than man, than the human being. Heidegger saw in this the essence of humanity, the authentic Greek definition of humankind, is according to him the one who is strangest of all. The essence is humankind captures the extremes, what is in Greek called topinotaton. And of course in Greek the word dinos, the adjective, may stand for something positive as well as negative. Dinos rhetor, great orator, or vini catastasi awful situation. Man, man is the non in the sense that he is the terrible, violent one, and also in the sense that he uses violence against the overpowering. Man is twice the non, this double, uh, terrible, what is terrible um, at two levels is very important that we get back to this. Covenant number three, transcendence. In a series of lectures he gave, Heidegger gave in 1942, uh, again influenced by and responding to Helderlin's uh, hymn, The Easter, he considers that Antigone takes on the destiny she has been given, but does not follow a path that is opposed to that of the humankind. So she, is, she respects her destiny, but she doesn't go about to oppose or to negate what is understood as uh, the legacy of humanity, described in the Coral Oath. So when Antigone opposes Creon, her suffering, the uncanny, okay, this strange, troublesome situation, is between and betwixt, is her supreme action. Let me turn to anthropology, physical and cultural. Homo sapiens sapiens, this is our species. Everything we discuss from an anthropological point of view refers to Homo sapiens sapiens, whether of uh, ancient times or modern times. Why sapiens sapiens? According to anthropologists, this is the capacity of the species to reflect on his, her reflections, this double reflection. Double reflection yields choice. There is the choice of uh, everything, behind everything we do, uh, there is always an ego um, accompanying uh, the sense of reality and the meanings attached to the action. So there is the choice of ego proliferation through differentiation, differentiation on the level, on, at the level of reflection. Each time we reflect, then we doubly reflect, doubly reflect, because other mammals, they can reflect, but not doubly reflect as far as we know. So whenever we doubly reflect, we differentiate. 
By differentiating, ego appears in a new form. So the one reality that the choice of Homo sapiens sapiens has uh, endowed us with is ego consciousness. The other one is ego transcendence, whereby differentiation stops and integration takes its place. Uh, this dialectic between ego proliferation, ego consciousness, and ego transcendence, I call, I use the words, the common parlance words, the political and the spiritual. By political I mean anything we do, we think, however we interpret and realize the world in sense, in the sense of an ego consciousness. Be it positive, negative, however defined and assessed. And uh, by spiritual I mean anything that uh, implies transcendence of ego. That could be momentary, that could be um, more steady, and therefore we can talk about altered states of consciousness as realized states of consciousness. Um, what is the implication of this physical anthropological theory for our purpose here is that reflecting on the social level Spirituality and politics are behind the dialectic between consciousness and power. And they are always rendered in a twofold way. There's nothing we deal with without the aspect of consciousness, however defined and approach, and without the aspect of politics either in the form of sharing for the good of the society or manipulating or, or you name it. Where ego thrives, that's a political dimension of the choice. Where ego loses its fervor, then spirituality emerges. Covenant number five, the dialectic of consciousness and power. This is a, the core, it forms the core of human culture since the dawn of humanity. According to cultural anthropological studies, uh, which uh, are always studies of culture, myth and ritual encompass the essence of the dialectics between consciousness and power. We are not to identify consciousness as seen before, Yes, thank you. Uh, as seen before, as a purely spiritual endeavor, but when we focus on the society, then uh, consciousness becomes, through myth, through ritual, through ceremonial performances, becomes a way to talk about the strange aspects of the notaton <coughs> that Heidegger wanted us to focus on. As my friend and good colleague uh, Barat uh, said earlier, the historical, the Western historical of modernity changed our perspective of the world. I'm well aware because I have done extensive work among a Greek traditional community on Carpathos Island, whereby people sing to one another their ideas, their thoughts, and there is a rhyming professor coupling there, and there is allegory, there is everything, so there is a performative uh, way of uh, negotiating your place in the world. Uh, there is, it is important to differentiate between what we call shame cultures and guilt cultures. I don't have the time to get into the details, but shame and guilt are not the same thing. Because in the one case, you are the individual and you are subject to the laws of the society. In the other case, you are not the individual. You are the person representing the families. The families representing the history of your culture, therefore the community. 
So this struggle between the state and culture, the community and uh, uh, individuals um, in power is, a fun is of fundamental significance to understanding the dynamics of a particular society. So, um, let me say that uh, one would say that Antigone is a perfect example uh, of civil disobedience. But civil disobedience, as Heidegger noted, <coughs> the denotator, an aspect, a manifestation of the denotator, where, it does it, where does it come from? Of course, the great dramatist can make a beautiful, a very Vinon drama and attract the attention of his community. But what is the real essence behind the myth or the myths um, informing the play? This one, that one, that aspect cannot be understood merely through aesthetics. There has to be a spiritual awareness. Otherwise, the deeper meaning of the myth is lost forever. So, and, so uh, a same culture which relies on its traditions, actually lived and enacted traditions, they may have ways toward <coughs> rediscovering the hidden secrets of humanity. This is very important. Because not only discovering out there in the thin air, uh, the society will provide its people with the necessary equipment to do so. It's not a metaphysical speculation, the divine other. So, uh, it seems to me that any attempt at um, going deeper into interpretation, interpreting, or translating uh, the great heritage of the ancient Greek tragedy and other heritages, so in that sense, should focus on the hidden meanings of, uh, of the myths. What are myths? Myths are stories. But what kind of stories? Not folk tales. These are, uh, these are the crystallized uh, um, perceptions of uh, communities in their effort to understand the human condition. So when they are uttered, when they are articulated, it is, they are, of course, entertainment. But what kind of an entertainment? One that bridges what we today call secular as opposed to uh, spi divine. divine, spiritual. But for those people, there was, there was no difference. It was one. A was one, and spirituality, not religion, but spirituality, is the way to reaching, to attaining the highest, which is self-realization. Self-realization in the context and with the respect of others, what has been delivered, passed on to you. And just to finish, I'll use a Greek word, parados, tradition. We usually think that paradoxy what we, is what we hand over uh, from one generation to the other. But the Greek word has another aspect to it. Paradidome, surrendering. If you, if you receive something from the older generation without surrendering, there is no way you can attain self-realization or come to the understanding of the divine meaning as a realized consciousness. Thank you. Um, panel will all will be in English, so we will begin. There is a uh, a change in the program, so. Miss uh, will uh, 
transfer to the other to the next session and be the first speaker. And we have with us the first speaker of the other session because he he has to cut uh, what the train was. Yes, like yes, yes. Uh, Vios Lapis, um, who is now forgive me for this because I didn't have the information for a moment and I want to read. Is professor head of the postgraduate program of theater studies at the Open University of Cyprus. Thank you. And he will speak. Just you go ahead and give us the time. Yes, the time is. Uh, well, I'm going to be speaking about uh, Anne Parsons' Antigonic, and I'm going to be claiming that this is a text worthy of our attention because it actually is many texts together. It's a uh, you know, for, for lack of a better term, I call it a transtextual palimpsest, which I understand, of course, is a terribly pompous and pretentious term. But uh, as I'm going to try to show, uh, this is a, a palimpsest which is also highly intertextual and which is also a kaleidoscope of transtextuality in the sense that it incorporates a plethora of different discourse types, different modes of enunciation, different literary or paraliterary genres, including parody, citation, commentary, and so on and so forth. Now, why do I call it a palimpsest? Uh, to begin with, um, Anne Carson, the famous Canadian poet herself, <laughs> is highly receptive and highly attuned to the idea of the palimpsest. I'm quoting here an interview to um, Aitken in which she uh, points out that texts of ancient Greeks come to us in wreckage and I admire that. The combination of layers of time that you have when looking at a papyrus that was produced in the 3rd century BC and then copied and then wrapped around the mummy for a couple of hundred years and then discovered and put in the museum and pieced together by nine different gentlemen and put back in the museum and brought out again and photographed and put in the book. All those layers add up to more and more life. And uh, um, uh, a multi-layer text is precisely what Arne Ka Carson's Antigone is. To begin with, the book itself has a distinctly handmade feel. It consists of recto pages, the verso is blank, so you have recto pages with hand-inked blocks of text, alternating with um, uh, illustrations printed on trans lucent vellum. And that's important because you can superimpose the translucent, the diaphanous uh, vellum over the, uh, the text page and get a, get, a combination, uh, get a combination of text and image which is not normally possible in conventional typography. Uh, so, uh, a reader can choose to simply, you know, turn the vellum page in order to get directly to the text, or the reader can choose to approach the text first through the vellum page, uh, so that Carson's words form an amalgam with the illustrations which are, I should mention, by Bianca Stowe. Uh, so it is a, a sort of amalgamation that seems to be, to be in some cases invited or indeed imposed by the physical arrangement of underlying text blocks and overlaying illustration uh, in certain cases. This is a, a, a case in point, the one you have uh, before you, I hope, yes you have it. Uh, here you see the blocks of text, no, not really, and then here comes Tiresias, and then episode 5 in red letters. The blocks of text are arranged very carefully and cleverly on the top and bottom of the page, with the central zone of the page left empty. And of course, the central zone is the zone that's occupied on the vellum page, on the translucent vellum page, in which the images, you know, the horse, the horse's dimensions are carefully calculated so as not to extend beyond the corresponding central register um, so as to leave the top and the bottom of the page blank. So, 
the result is that you can read the text blocks um, without hindrance, even through the superimposed image. Uh, so what's, what's achieved in this way is, it, is a, a fusion of text and image, which obviously is intentional and therefore significant. What significance um, uh, it may have is, of course, a matter of speculation. I'm thinking that the image, which is a, a horse's lower torso, its two front legs entangled in red thread, down lines from a reeling spool. Um, this image taken in combination with the ominous stage direction, here comes Tiresias, makes me think that uh, uh, one needs to place that hobbled horse in context. And what's, what's the context in that part of the play? The context, of course, is that in response to Tiresias' warnings, Creon will rush to liberate Antigone from her underground prison, but his belated, woefully belated diligence will of course turn out to be inadequate. So, like Bianca Stone's hobbled horse, Creon will run fast, but not nearly fast enough. Uh, so, this, this interaction between image and text which may originate in graphic novel aesthetics, um, is an interaction that transcends, as I said before, conventional typography to achieve a new synthesis of text and image. The reader is forced to collate the image with the text and the text with the image, thereby intertwining image and text into new and unexpected combinations. So that's one way in which Anne Carson's Antigone is a, a palimpsest. Now, I also said that this is, it is, a, it is an intertextual palimpsest, or maybe transtextual palimpsest, and I'm going to say a few words on why I think that. Um, in general, Antigone and Carson's Antigone has the same dramatis persona as Sophocles' Antigone. But, Anne Carson has innovated in at least one case. She has included a person called Nick, hence the title, Antigo Nick. Uh, he is designated, Nick is designated as a nude part. He is always on stage and he measures things. And in the final stage direction, we read excellent omnes, everyone exits, except Nick, who continues measuring. So, he is a perpetual presence. This Nick person is a perpetual presence. He's on stage even before the first speaking characters appear, and he remains on stage even after the whole cast has exited, has departed. Um, here's a title page, which even graphically even in terms of design and layout, makes clear this combination between Antigone and Nick. So it, even typographically, Nick is foregrounded. Uh, now, who is Nick? Who the hell is Nick? Uh, Nick is less a character, I think, and more a linguistic construct, a textual construct, a composite organism made up of homonymy, wordplay, and intertextuality. First of all, Nick can easily be associated, I and mean, you will have thought of that already, I'm sure. Nick's name can easily be associated with the expression in the nick of time. And Eurydice uh, makes this association obvious when she says, Have you heard this expression, the nick of time? What is a nick? I ask my son. What is a nick? I ask my son. Uh, so, one of Carson's characters points to the possibilities of homonymy, the possibilities of wordplay, the possibilities of linguistic inventiveness afforded by this character, Nick. So, I wonder whether we may not actually go one step further and try to see how Nick and the associative wordplay that his name encourages can fit into the general scheme of the play. In the nick of time implies last minute rescue or, it, or escape, but of course in Sophocles' Antigone, uh, timing is almost always bad. 
and, and uh, the time is an agent of disaster. Antigone manages indeed to escape in the nick of time after her first burial of Polynices, but he's, she's caught in the act during the second burial, um, when a windstorm subsides just in time, in the nick of time indeed, uh, and reveals Antigone to the guards watching over Polynices' body. And when Creon, at the end of the play, finally heeds Tiresias' warnings and rushes to Antigone's rescue, the fleeting hope that the girl may, may be saved in the nick of time is, of course, belied as soon as it turns, turns out that Antigone has hanged herself in her subterranean prison, which, of course, is called Nick in British slang. Creon had hoped that by arresting or by nicking Antigone, he would be able to keep both the city and his own family in good shape or in good nick. But he has failed miserably. Antigone's suicide precipitates an avalanche of further suicides, Hemon suicide, Eurydice's suicide, which of course devastated Creon's house, bringing it down in one fell swoop. Now, uh, Nick, of course, is, as I said, is a textual construct. He is, of course, a character, or pretends to be a character. His name is spelled with a capital N. Uh, uh, Nick, with a capital N, cannot fail to evoke the devil himself, Old Nick, in English. Or even uh, Old Nick Machiavel, the archetypal stage villain of Elizabethan and Jacobean drama first mentioned by Shatley Marmion in his 1641 play, The Antiquary, uh, who uh, uh, makes this association. Now, let me take a few, let, let me say a few words in the five or so minutes that are left about um, translation as adaptation in Anne Parsons Antigone. Uh, Antigone presents itself as a translation, but it is, of course, much more than that. It is, for one thing, it is rife with creative wordplay. Um, one case of wordplay is pointed out by the Guardian theatre critic, Charlotte Higgins, who says that Carson produces a memorable line, archives of grief I see falling on this house. Now, the original Greek at this point reads Archaia Talaptaki Tanoikon Romai Pemata and so on. From ancient times I see the trumps of the dead. How does Carson move from the ancient evils of the Lapis's house to archives of grief? Well, she moves there, as Charlotte Higgins, the Guardian critic, points out, because of the accidental phonetic similarity between the Greek word archaia, which means ancient, and the English word archives. But of course, one is, um, cannot help thinking here that the English word archives comes itself ultimately from the Greek, although from a different Greek word, the word archaea, public records, which in turn <coughs> derives from the word arche, government or rule. So, <coughs> The Antigone myth, in its variants from Sophocles to Anne Carson, is a record, is an archive, archaea, of the ancient evils, archaea, pemata, which have beset the race of Oedipus, who have been holding sway, arche, in Thebes, generation after generation. Finally, Anne Carson engaged in uh, um, uh, uh, again, a very, uh, a very interesting sort of intertextual dialogue with previous translations of Sophocles and Tiffany. Primarily, the uh, translation made in late Victorian times by Sir Richard Jebb, the famous uh, Greek scholar, the famous British scholar of Greek literature. Uh, there is this point where Cre uh, Carson's characters, uh, in particular Creon, suddenly switch to what looks like a faux Elizabethan Jacobean idiom. And upon closer inspection, this turns out to be chunks of quoted text from Richard Jebb's late Victorian translation, which of course sounded archaic 
when it was published because it evoked um, the uh, idiom of um, Elizabethan and Jacobean tragedy. Oh, shameless thou art a miscreant to prosecute thy known father, and so on and so forth. Uh, what I think uh, Carson is doing here is that she makes visible the palimpsestic nature of her text and she brings out the fact that often goes unacknowledged that every translation must confront and must assimilate not only the source text but also that text's previous translation. Okay, every translation comes in a long line hmm, uh, of, of earlier translations. Uh, and uh, that was a reminder to myself that I should be finishing. Uh, so this is, a, I'm going to be finishing one minute. This is an act of self-awareness uh, on Anne Carson's part, this allusion to previous translations. But also, uh, of course, Anne Carson is also a classical scholar. She's a philologist. She has taught at uh, McGill University in Canada, in Montreal. Now she's teaching, I believe, at Michigan. So she's very much aware of the technical aspects of a philologist's work. And she incorporates even those aspects, of a, those very technical aspects of a philologist's works, work into her own text. When, for instance, she has Hemon. Um, break to his father the alarming news of uh, popular discontent brewing against him. Um, Haemon is, of course, hesitant to break the news to his father. And very interestingly, he couches his hesitation in the philological jargon of textual criticism. Yet I could not, would not, do not know how to say you are wrong. It may be some other way, I don't know, might turn out. I delete this line which is what a, a classical scholar does. I am your defender, I'm yours. Yet I hear there is talk, there are shadows. This girl here, I posit a lacuna. This girl does not deserve to die. The town is sad and so on and so forth. So, to conclude, as well as exploring the limits of translation and even pushing them to extremes, and Carson's Antigonic also engages in an exploration of its own textual and transtextual nature, which is to say its relation manifest or hidden with other texts. And I'm quoting here Gérard Genet's definition in a book called, very appropriately, Palimpsest. Palimpsests. Antigonic's transtextuality includes, but is not limited to, its incorporation of a variety of different translation traditions and of textual philological scholarship, as we just saw, as well as of a complex nexus of wordplay, pastiche, parody, reverse translation, all of which branch out in all sorts of directions, as well as focalizing Carson's core concern, a true theme, which is translation, language, and textuality. Thank you so much. Our next speaker will be Mr. Kakumoto, who has come from Japan. Um, he is theater director and artistic director of the Womo Ex Machina. Womo Ex Machina. And uh, he will speak. The title of his speech is. Um, Performing media, theatrical performance as a way of understanding ancient society and classical philosophy. Ah, good afternoon. And first of all, I have to understand uh, the P to CC, who is the, uh, who is the, uh, the director of the whole Anarodio Festival, who invited me to do uh, this presentation. And I'm coming from Japan, 
as he explained, and I'm Seattle director, and maybe you can I think today, many in the presentation, we saw her lesson was somehow done by the, 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 kind of the researcher in the way the researcher's own uh, image taking care of the ancient tragedy. And for me, I also uh, find the research of history, but today I try uh, I, I, maybe the CC invited me to come here as a kind of representing the artistic side of the members of this community here. And I will explain uh, about something uh, what I so far did taking care with the ancient tragedy. But to show something what I did as creation, it's not easy or it's almost impossible here to present because it's much easier and also it's always the uh, only way to present is something on stage. So today what I explain is the what I here explain is only thing that why I am doing that kind of thing which I did. Or maybe the word the professor Oliver something used in this morning, in the beginning of this morning, that what is my priority? Because there's so many theatre directors, maybe from the time of the ancient Greece up until now, there's so, so many directors creating something with the ancient tragedy. And also, if we are thinking about uh, our contemporary in Japan also, although we don't uh, receive nothing directly from the ancient Greek society, still we have many production of the Greek tragedy. <coughs> and for me, like for example, uh, maybe some of you might know or might saw one uh, of the the performance of Medea, Euripides Medea. Uh, because that was uh, touring uh, Athens also, and his name is Ninagawa Yukio, and he created his own version of Medea, uh, and he said it is something using the Euripides Medea. And for me, as a kind of a performance, if I ignore that is based on Euripides, there are so many things interesting or how the performer of that uh, the creation uh, uh, very focused on stage and doing something very nice as a kind of performing art. But for me, it is nothing related to every piece because how he taking care of the text, although he read the Japanese translation of that, he just took a kind of the image or his own image of the uh, what is mother or what can be the mother who is trying to kill his child and what is the emotion of the mind when the mother is trying to <coughs> kill his child because of his own <coughs> With this, I think it's nothing in the main focus of the Olympians himself. But only that Minamama want to bring that because this is kind, this kind of the agony of the mother uh, having the spread image one side of the love to his her own children and also to the other side to a kind of uh, the, the purpose which she should do is very difficult in the Japanese traditional performing arts like kabuki or like bunda. There are so many of the same thing. But from my own understanding, I think the Athenian tragedy are somehow quite different. And still, I know that there are so many uh, people after the time of the Athenian demo uh, democracy and where the Athenian tragedy are first performed, there are so many people who try to 
put something of their own society, but it's that something always bit away from the reality of the very old time, uh, and it's this the very big influence are uh, from the uh, the Latin people or Roman people who think that the Greek antiquity is very important 